hosting an amazing person. And this is one of the, it's been like the easiest startup grind Pfizer chat I've ever prepared for, but also the hardest. <laughs> it's hard because like, okay, how much can I ask and how long do we, how much time do we have? Because my guest for today, Lelemba Piri, I actually live in a house. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I share a house with her. Um, she's actually my wife. <laughs> so, <laughs> she's my primary investor. So for the, for, <laughs> for the time that Stella Grand was not sustainable and I was paying for it, you know who was really paying for it. <laughs> uh, so Lelemba is the principal at Africa Trust Group, and Africa Trust Group is the operating partners for Enigma Ventures. And Enigma Ventures just launched now, it's got a hundred million rand fund for women businesses in SADC, summoning all the countries in Southern Africa. And we're really looking forward to working with women entrepreneurs. And we're super excited to have Lelemba here. And Lelemba has worked in government has worked in private sector who was part of the, the zona team and helped to scale it into three countries and she's written an ebook financial fitness in five workouts she's also done and um, well, she studied uh, she's a cs she's a chartered accountant with uh, oxford brooks university she graduated with honors and um, she did an MBA, uh, a Master's in Development, Development Finance and graduated with a distinction. Oh. <laughs> and now she is, is starting to do a PhD and she got her results now for her first part. Again, like the past month is 70 and she gets 85. Who does that? <laughs> <laughs> So, ladies and gentlemen, let's put your hands together and welcome Lennon Mapiri. Hello, Lennon <laughs> Hi, Sandra. Cool. Welcome to South Brian. Thank you very much. I don't the think six. my microphone is on. Thank you very much. Is it me? <laughs> Maybe probably move. Okay. Hello. Let's come again. Okay. Aish, <laughs> come. Maybe we share a mic. Do you want to be on this side, baby? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't like this side, though. <laughs> Hello? No. So. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to project actually. Okay, okay, cool. we'll have to share it. Huh? Okay. Okay. Cool, it says two minutes. So the microphone only works with me. Yeah. And <laughs> it does. <laughs> It was working before. Okay. Work. okay, now to work with you. Yeah, yeah. I promise it will. Okay. Good evening, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome to Star Grind, and um, you can. I'd like us to talk about your background. I know we were born in the same city. <laughs> <laughs> you were born two years. After I was born, <laughs> probably I was checking you out at under five. <laughs> <laughs> but only really makes much later. But tell me about your growing up. What was it like growing up as a kid in Kitwe? Um, so I was born in Kitwe in Zambia. It's the second largest city in the country. Um, I think growing up there was. Uh, pretty fairly standard upbringing um, in Zambia. I come from a very big family. There's 11 siblings altogether. 
Um, at the time, I was the youngest, and uh, um, our family almost had this, it's six girls and five boys. And when I was really young, I kind of overheard my uh, mom having a conversation which made it look like she was more excited about when she was having boys than when she was having girls. <laughs> and so I thought it was just like way cooler to be a boy and I decided I'm just gonna act like a boy for the most part by growing up. Yeah. Yeah. And that was on the east side of Wakanda. And that was the east side. Let's <laughs> <laughs> see. I grew up on the south side though. So. Okay. But yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm used to his cheesy jokes, guys, so... <laughs> Me and the kids are used to the cheesy jokes. Uh, they keep saying they're dry, but they laugh. And I say it's dry, but you can drink it. <laughs> cool. You know, tell us more about um, your upbringing and that, what, what did that do for you and how did you behave when yeah. you overheard your mom talking about or getting excited about boys? I really thought that it was probably more fun being a boy and that boys kind of got away with stuff a lot more and um, I used to obsess for a while about uh, what would have my name been if I was a boy and uh, how do you think I would look if I was a boy and for the most part I liked moving around topless as well kind of feeling I thought you could just decide um, what gender you could be so I thought I'm just a boy um, and I was entertained for a while. My mom was answering back. What would I have been called? She would kind of let me know. Mm -hmm. um, and what would you have been called? I would have been called Luby. Okay. And I was obsessed with being called Luby for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> named after my dad's oldest brother. Okay. Um, until I was eight and my boobs started coming in. Yeah. And I was kind of told you can't walk around top this anyone. <laughs> and I think I had a little bit of a meltdown as to why I couldn't walk around top this. And I uh, was told it's because you're a girl. And uh, I was very shocked. Like, so what does that actually mean then? Can't I decide, you know, what sex I want to be? Why do I have to be a girl? Um, but it's in those conversations um, that it became very clear. Like, my, my dad and my mom made it really clear that for them, whether we were girls or boys, we were as important to them and that my dad kept reiterating throughout my growing up like you can be anything you want to be um, and you can do anything that boys can do and maybe even more and in fact he said at some point you have so much power you have to be really responsible about what you do with that power as a girl and so for the most part that was my frame of mind growing up I was super competitive in um, primary school I always wanted to be top of the class. I was always proving a point that I could be good and better than boys. Um, but it was that constant reassurance from my parents, I think, that gave me a lot of confidence, yeah. Yeah, and it's interesting, like, in grade 9, when we found out later when we were talking, like, you got 99% in mathematics and got 98% in science. And then I got 99% in science and 98% in mathematics. <laughs> And then we found that we had the same marks, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us about your high school. <laughs> I went to a, an all-girls convent school. I think it was part of my mom's mission to get me a little bit more feminine growing up. I sent me to an all-girls school. Uh, it was a very, they were very firm with us uh, in terms of what we were allowed to do. For example, when we went on school field trips, I was always a little bit rebellious. I was in the quiz team, so oh gosh, I used to go on a lot of outings, but I was rebellious. In grade 11, I got suspended for speaking to boys on a school trip. <laughs> yeah, for speaking to boys. We were not allowed to speak to boys when we were on a school trip. And uh, we had uh, snuck out of our res, actually, to go and hang out um, with boys. <laughs> It, we didn't organize the hangout, we were just invited to the hangout. So that was our excuse, and we got suspended. And you were super ingenious, it was before WhatsApp, Insta, yes. all of that. Yes. <laughs> Somehow the, the hangout news always came out, I don't know how, because we had no cell phones. Yeah. But everybody just kind of knew where to rock up. And I got suspended, and I think that was a big moment for me, because um, I was always like a really good performer in school and uh, and so I got 
I think, slightly easier with my misbehavior at home because of that. But when I got home, I was on suspension for two weeks. I was crying. I was telling my dad, I don't want to go back to the school. I don't want to go back. The nun doesn't like me. She's so strict on us, and I don't want to go back. And he kind of like heard it out for the first few days, said nothing. And I played the same thing with my mom. And my mom was very much on my side. She was just like, they're being unfair. I mean, they're teenagers. Of course, they want to hang out. It's not like they're doing anything. Blah, blah, blah. And started having the negotiation with my dad about whether to move schools. Um, and I, I could get into any school with my marks. And so I was just like picking the school. I was even making plans about what school I'd go to. And my father refused. He said, you are setting her up uh, for failure because in life, when things are hard, we don't run away. When things are hard, we face them, we go back and dance to the consequences of our behavior, and we need to find a way of recovering from that and moving on. Yeah. And that was a big lesson for me. So I had to go back to my school and find we were making up with the headmistress nun. Yeah, <laughs> cool. And Funny, I also went to an like an old yeah. boys school, which was a Catholic school. I was supposed to be a priest. Yeah. <laughs> I have absolutely nothing to do with him not becoming a priest. <laughs> if if I become a priest, you know why then? Like, yeah, it didn't work. Therefore, I'm a priest now. You know, <laughs> but that suspension also. I you mentioned at some point you mentioned that. You were so afraid and just yeah. keep chattering and it was also another turning point for you in yeah. terms of fear. Yeah. And you were not afraid no. for the most part. No. Uh, all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that. So um, when we went for the hangout, we were 16, so we we're kids, right? We, we went for this hangout, we were super excited about we never used to hang out with boys. We were in a get, get conference school, so it was pretty exciting hanging out with boys. But I remember when the person rang the alarm and said, the nuns are coming. <laughs> we were so scared. I mean, one of my friends jumped out of a first floor window. That's how scared we were of the nuns. Jumped out of a first floor window. Thank goodness, she's super athletic. She did all sorts of long jump, high jump, march down a short distance. So she landed well and rolled, you know, like, it was like, it was like cat woman. Like, just kind of landed and rolled. And I am watching my friend jump out the first floor window. I'm scared because we were so frightened of the dance. I literally, like, snuck on the side of the stairs because it was a like first floor, side of the stairs. Somehow when they were coming up, they didn't see me because a lot of people were scampering around. And I was just walking, so I was like, I looked calm. But we got to our room and we were so scared. We said, what do you do? We said, let's open the Bible. <laughs> let's find out what the Lord has to say to us. I have no idea what page we opened, but it was something to do that you will be punished for your sins. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord speaks in mysterious ways. The Lord speaks in mysterious ways. You will be punished. <laughs> we were so afraid, I slept with my teeth chattering. Do you know cartoons when they're like shivering? I slept with my teeth chattering. When I woke up in the morning, my, my jaw was so sore, like I'd been chewing gum in my sleep. Um, but for the whole week when we went back to school, they didn't talk to us about that incident. So we knew we were in trouble. They're not even talking to you there. We, and we were trying our best, like we won the quiz. I'm just like, let's do whatever it takes to just make them forget about this thing. When we got to the school, they didn't talk to us for a whole week, so it was like mental torture of note. I remember every day going to sleep really afraid. And on the final day, after a week, when uh, the headmistress decided to call us in, I was shaking so bad. My knees were uh, like, you know, hitting against each other. And I got into this headmistress's room and I thought to myself, my goodness, what's the worst that can actually happen in here? You know, like what is the actual worst that can happen in here? I've been afraid for like a week and three days of another person because I like because of what? I'm just kind of imagining. I sat there and I thought, what's the worst that could happen here? And the worst was I'll be expelled, right? That would be the worst. Doesn't mean I'm dead, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm 16, my life could go on. And but that taught me something about fear. Like I think that 
without interrogating what our real fear is, we tend a lot to exaggerate how wrong it can go. But if you really think about what's the worst can, that can happen, it's usually not that bad. I could get expelled, of course I was a top performer, I could go to another school and my life continues. Mm. Or they wouldn't. They would punish me maybe for a week. We we had to do a lot of manual work as well to, for the punishment, and I'd still go on. And so for me, that moment I decided I will never be that afraid of another human being <laughs> again, or be in such a situation where I feel like it's the end of the world when it actually isn't. If you interrogate it, mm. yeah. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And um, from there, tell us about your like an. I think another tough moment again, which was defining for you, was um, around finishing school, yeah. trying to go to, to, to college, mm. and your mom passing away. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, soon after my suspension, actually, mm. um, my mom had been super supportive through that. My mom passed away. It was, it was quite sudden, it was a short illness. Um, and so it was a complete shock on the family. Um, my dad remarried quite quickly, and in, in retrospect, it all makes sense. You know, all of us were pretty scared, and we, we were a big family, and we were majority girls. He had no idea what he was going to do with these female children, <laughs> like teen and above, you know. Um, but we had a very rough patch. Me, my stepmother, my dad at that point, um, and eventually I was kind of asked to move out, politely. <laughs> politely, because I really was being a very messy teenager. But it was just at, after the end of uh, my high school, and in, in our African context, when you're asked to move out, you've got 27 million options of aunties and uncles you can go to, so it's not like you're in the streets. Okay, so it's not really an odd story. So I kind of hopped from aunt to aunt, kind of telling my rebellion story and how unfair it is that this is happening to me. And uh, really, nobody was entertaining it, obviously. It's, it's like when you're, when you're in a disco and you're trying to fight with a door bouncer, <laughs> you're always going to be on the losing end. I'm like, oh, nobody's listening to me. And everyone's like, mm, we know teenagers, teenagers are a problem. But what ended up happening is I landed at a cousin's place and my dad wasn't speaking to me at that point. And my cousin said to me, look, I can provide a roof over your head, but I'm not going to pay. I can't afford actually to pay for your tertiary education, so you're going to have to figure that out. And that meant I had to work um, on my school holidays. I did a lot of entrepreneurial stuff. I started my first business. Uh, first, I was selling chickens. And then I was selling rice, and then uh, my runaway product was crotchless underwear. So uh, <laughs> was, uh, for, for college kids. Yes. <laughs> crotchless underwear was my runaway product, believe it or not. Like, it, 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 yeah. yeah, right next to the chicken cell. <laughs> it was a lingerie counter in my room. <laughs> I, I went where the market was going. Okay. <laughs> Give the customer what they need. I don't know. <laughs> and um, in fact, my choice of going into accounting in the first place was because it was the quickest way I could get financially independent. Because with accounting, you could do maybe like a six months part of a course and do some work and then go back and do some work. So there was that flexibility, and that's really how I ended up in finance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. And can you take this now, um, very briefly around just your experience from the Zambia Revenue Authority yeah. of that, and then am I up to Zona? Okay. Um, I I think I've, I've had a pretty exciting career. Um, my first first job was um, managing a photo studio, and so it was a. It was a tiny photo studio in, in the city on a corner. Um, and I was everything from the cashier, bookkeeper, to the model for the different types of pictures. <laughs> you have, I can't even remember what happened to those pictures. There would, there would be a photo of you and then they'll put it in the clouds, you know? Yeah. They'll edit it and put it in. You look like you were dead, seriously. <laughs> you don't look like you were dead because your head is like in the clouds. Or they'll put leaves around your face, you know, these editing things. 
that was my first job. And then um, when I was at the professional level of my CA studies, when, I, when technically what you call articles comparatively here, I joined the Revenue Authority in Zambia. And so I worked there for about three years and then met him and we decided we're going to move to South Africa. He was my neighbor, by the way, that's how I met him. He was my neighbor. We, we got married 10 months after meeting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And that was 13 years ago. Yeah. 14 years ago. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 14 years ago. When we met. Married, married 13 years. Married 13 years. Oh, yeah. Cool. So we knew each other for, for 10 months okay. and got married. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. And, and then now the transition, like coming to SA, yeah. we also would like, those are a period when we're both not working. Yeah. You're not working, I wasn't working. Then I got a job, then you got a job with MI. Mm -hmm. um, what was it like at MI and what are some of the, the things you got to realize and yeah. like in the industry? You worked a lot with men yeah. and a lot like with the uh, international and kind of like uh, uh, cosmopolitan, so to speak, yeah. stuff. Tell us about your experience. Um, so moving here, um, a thing that you don't realize, I think, growing up in a lot of African cultures is, um, like Zambia is 95% black people and 98% Christian. So there isn't a lot of diversity in terms of race and religion and stuff. And however, we, we do mix very easily across races. Um, growing up, my, my, one of my favorite hangout buddies, um, who's technically my cousin, um, had a really mixed group of friends. And so growing up, I kind of just hang out with everybody. So when I moved here, it wasn't something that was like racial disparity and noticing racial differences wasn't something that was front and center for me. And so when I joined the oil industry, my first job here was in the oil industry. It was a very international company. There was people coming out of Cuba, out of Colombia, Spain. It was very international. And I think I worked in the company for a year when the uh, help, our help who used to help in the kitchen and stuff said to me, hi. I said, hi, how do you feel working here? <laughs> so I was like, oh, I really like it, but I'm too uncomfortable. I said, what do you mean? And she said, you're the only black person here. I hadn't noticed it, believe it or not. <laughs> I had not noticed it. And so I was like, oh, I worked there for a year. And firstly, I guess part of it was because all of us were foreign. So the majority of us, maybe only 10% of the company was local. The majority of us were foreign. So coming together, we kind of hang out with each other. And it, it never came up. you know as foreigners and that was the first time I actually become a lot more conscious about it and the fact that maybe in being an outsider um, gave me a different look on the dynamics internally and um, that comes with responsibility as well yeah yeah and so working in that environment was great because I got to work in a lot of African countries I worked in like eight African countries over that period um, and learning a lot of the different dynamics across the continent and seeing what makes South Africa unique, both from the really amazing side and from the things that need fixing. Um, but that was really my first experience, mm, yeah. Mm, brilliant. And uh, at some point then you got tired of yeah. <laughs> you know, where you where you quit yeah. to just figure things out. Yeah. It was like dumping somebody for nobody. <laughs> You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm leaving you. Are you going out with somebody else? No. no. <laughs> Tell us, like, how bad was it? <laughs> so, the, the, yeah, I loved, I loved it. I loved the oil industry. Um, there were great people. However, I didn't like what we stood for eventually. And one particular trip was a turning point for me. It was a trip into Congo, Brazzaville. And it's quite a poor country. And uh, getting landing into Congo Brazzaville, you could see how disorganized things were. I mean, there were houses next to the runway, for example. 
and driving all the way to our rig, there was a lot of like waste from paper mills and oil. You know, it's a rich country but very poor. And so we were driving there, and I'm just kind of looking around at how dirty the surroundings are and how poor people are. But when we got to our rig compound, very high security, all that stuff. It's like getting into a country, you're taking out your passport, you're taking out your company passes and stuff like that. But when we drove in, it looked like a resort in Cancun. And that just broke my heart. I said, there's, there's, I, could, I couldn't get over how immediately just outside of that uh, fence, there was so much poverty, and then just inside of the fence, we were living in luxury. Everyone was so excited to meet me. Like I was being asked, have you been, like, there was like three or five restaurants in that compound, that's how big this compound was. Did you go to the Jamaican restaurant? And I, I couldn't just get over it. And I decided, no, I was not gonna eat from the restaurants in the compound, I would actually be going out to eat in the restaurants in the town and just kind of to meet the people and eat the local food. But that was my moment um, where I felt like I've got a lot to give and I want to be in something that is a lot more impactful where I can feel like my contribution is landing somewhere where it makes a difference and in that big machine I was like really like a small cock in a very big wheel of a very big tractor on a very big ship you know and I, I couldn't really live with myself after that and when I came back we had a conversation and I told them I said I really feel like I'm having um, you know, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, and this is weighing very heavy. And luckily, he's a partner that said, quit. I said, really? I need to like six months to prepare. He says, no, just quit. Then you'll figure it out. And I took some time off to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And at that time, you went to, to Bali. You did oh, a yeah. program with Roger Hamilton. Yeah. And then you came it's back. It's so good to have somebody that knows your history like that. <laughs> <laughs> I forget <laughs> all these stories. <laughs> Yeah, and then a lot of the things that happened during that period. Yeah. Those that uh, the 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 work dynamics program yeah. as well as uh, the Dimatini program and led yeah. to you. Um, you wrote the book yeah. and then started doing financial fitness workshops actually in the same building. That's true, <laughs> actually. Um, so I took time out to kind of think. Um, about what I wanted to do next and where I really wanted to make a difference. And I was always quite driven to, um, a lot of my friends used to come to me asking for advice on how do you save money or how do you make money? Uh, it came a little bit natural for me because my mom was a super entrepreneur. So I grew up with a kick-ass mother who was an entrepreneur when it wasn't even fashionable, when it was more fashionable to be in, like a secretary in a big job and she quit a secretary or big job to be an entrepreneur. And so for me, I grew up like writing receipts, I was counting money in her shops. It came so naturally that I took that for granted and a lot of my friends were like, but how come you not you don't really stress about it? So how do you make money and how do you save money? And the questions were so repeat that uh, as part of my journey, I had gone off to Bali to do a program on work dynamics and there was a lot of soul searching. And one of the things was like we, we we've always kind of done business together. Uh, but one of the things that came out there was um, that one of the teachers said, it's going to be your journey for you first of all to find yourself because before you can really add value and always remaining connected with your partner in what you're doing will, will stifle you because you've got your own quite clear mission and you need to be brave enough to just kind of take that. I remember crying, I'm like, oh, is this going to mean a divorce with my husband? <laughs> it was all very dramatic. But I came back and I wrote my ebook on financial fitness and I targeted mainly at women. But the response was so big and so wide um, that men were emailing me about it and asking me questions around that book. And I started running workshops on financial fitness. And the first, very first workshop was here. It was called The Red Shit by, by then. Mm -hmm. It was in like a little room which was offered for free and we had four people mm -hmm. in that workshop. But the testimonials that came out of that then kind of just like, it, it flew away. Everybody was now yeah. attending my workshops. So. Uh, so it was Gwen from Extraordinary Women yeah. and there was... Um, Bettina. Yes, yes, mm. and a lot of other people. Yeah. And yeah, four other people. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, super hot. Yeah. And no air conditioning. No air conditioning. Air conditioning okay, cool. But now we will fast forward to mm. quickly on Zona and then mm. we'll talk about yeah, Enigma Ventures. Um, so whilst I was doing these financial fitness workshops. Um, 
I decided I was going to do my master's in development finance because I wanted to move my career from more corporate finance to more impact finance. And development finance was kind of like the natural choice. Um, but my, my profile had become quite high because of the workshops and uh, I was doing my master's from the GSP, from the Graduate School of Business. He was doing his MBA there. And so his classmates had kind of heard, were hearing about my workshops all the time and there was a little note that was kind of being mailed, forwarded and forwarded and forwarded and forwarded about um, a young company in the mobile money space that was looking for somebody to help build cultures between their office in Cape Town and their office in, in Zambia. And so actually one of his classmates forwarded that to me and said, I thought this would be perfect for you. So I mailed the guy, like I had to go down a trail of emails, that's how much that email was forwarded. <laughs> to find him, and I met with Zona's CFO, Keith. I'd never seen somebody so excited about finance, and I had been so tired of accounting, particularly. But he was excited about finance, but he was also very excited about the opportunity, and the company was quite small by the time I met them. And uh, I remember ask, calling my friends in Zambia and asking, because our, our name then, it wasn't Zona, it was Mobile Transactions Limited. So does anybody know about Mobile Transactions Limited? And everyone was just like, uh, no, we've never heard of it. And I thought to myself, oh, with my high profile, I don't know if I want to join a Mickey Mouse company. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so I was very tentative about actually joining um, the company. And I remember signing on for, for a month first. And I said, that's going to be a consulting gig. And I was sent on a trip to Zambia to, to sort out some that issue. But when I got into the market, um, I saw the potential of what it could do, particularly for women entrepreneurs. I met some fantastic women agents who were just doing the most with the little resources that they had to really provide a, a good service. And it was the sweet spot for me between impact and also like getting into the startup space. Yeah. Yeah. And um, what are all the roles that you had at oh, that? I was a yeah. financial controller and then I was in operations and administration. Then I moved to Zambia to become the managing director and then we opened up Malawi. So I was managing director for Zambia and Malawi. And then I was heading up talent, leadership development and talent. And then I was chief marketing officer. And for me, the, the, the most, most important thing um, about joining Zona is the fact that I realized that entrepreneurship, which is super important for all entrepreneurs to understand, doesn't necessarily have to mean you have to start the thing. Entrepreneurship is about the value that you have and that you can bring into a team. It, you, you will not win as an entrepreneur on your own. You can't win. Like it's it's not an individual sport. You have to think about the people that you are surrounding yourself with. Mm -hmm. And so joining the team, I could see the value that I could add to the team. They're amazing. They were amazing without me. But I could see the unique value that I could add, and that they valued that value that I was bringing to the table. And so upfront, there was already an agreement of equity being offered and that made me feel valued from the get-go. Um, there were always, every, every opportunity within the company was a conversation, like what, what, what do I want to do next and where am I seeing I can add value. There was, I was always suggesting I think I could do this role or this is what we need and there was always the mutual respect of making that happen and the, the support one-on-one. -on -one. And yeah, so it's, it's thinking about whenever you are getting on the entrepreneurial journey, is there already a company or a startup that is doing what you want to do and can you then add value? You don't always have to start it. Yeah. Great. Cool. Um, tell us now about the work you're doing now. Um, you've been working for over a year now with Africa Trust Group. You've been into investing, and now there's a launch of a 100 million rand fund for women businesses. Tell us about that, and then we'll um, go into just the 
But what do, yes, what, what do investors look for and then they're hacking? And then we'll go to, go to questions. Cool. Um, so I, I got into investing, I decided I'll get into investing June last year. Um, I was on a trip to Belgium and I had gone to a conference where they were talking about the progress that women are making in the world in terms of access to finance, technology, health, and all of that. And it still, it felt, it, I was very enthused being in the space on the first day. But on the next day, it kind of felt like everybody was enjoying more talking about it than doing something about it. Yeah, and it was at uh, that conference, there were about seven presidents, right? Ten. Ten presidents. We had five queens. And and five queens. Yeah, and ten presidents in that uh, Yeah, yeah. I, I was really... I didn't get clearance. No, he didn't even get clearance. <laughs> He still talks about not getting clearance to get. That was, beer. That was drinking virgin beer <laughs> outside. <laughs> so I, I was very nervous about speaking at that event because of um, uh, 10 presidents and five queens in the room. Um, but when I got into the space, I was so enthused. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is what I think I want to do next, get into this space. My whole career has had a golden thread of empowering women throughout. I mean, the, my, my book from 10 years ago was about that. Um, but the next day I realized that there was a lot of talking and everybody's kind of like enjoying it. And when I was kind of asking the funds there, I said, do you have a specific strategy or agenda around investing, particularly in women? It, was, it felt like it was always like a byproduct. And we're all here talking about progressing women and nobody's actually just focusing on it and doing it. And so um, I thought I'd get into that space. But thinking back on my journey and getting there, I realized that I was in a pretty unique position um, from my upbringing and um, the fact that I think in my career I've had a lot of very unique support um, throughout. I mean, the opportunities I had at Zona to work in so many roles and really be part of a growing startup that we scaled across four markets was in itself valuable. We were raising funds, so I knew about how to raise funds of all kinds, from grant funding to friends and family to the whole journey of Series A, B, you know, loans and all of that. And a lot of the entrepreneurs in our space haven't had that opportunity to go through that journey. And so I thought it would be quite interesting if we could try from an entrepreneur side to look at investing, you know, and help entrepreneurs along that same journey, um, give that same helping hand that I'd had and that we'd had on our journey to others. And so first I decided I was going to angel invest and just have a little bit of a personal journey, get to know the local entrepreneurs in the ecosystem. I'm happy to see that Cap H, what from my portfolio is yes. here as well, yes. from the early days of, and, uh, yeah, and last year. And Nikki. And Nikki is here as well. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So first of all, just that getting into the space, getting to see some of the entrepreneurs, like what are the real issues that we're talking about, um, and get a lot more personal. And I did that for a year, and I felt like I was in the space to really get serious about raising a fund, or at least talking to people who could help support raise a fund. Um, when I met the co-founders of Enigma Ventures, who were on a very similar path and trajectory, also entrepreneurs, and so in terms of alignment, we had similar vision around investing in women, but also similar vision around really changing finance to make it work for both entrepreneurs and investors, and not it being just about how do we get the most out of an entrepreneur. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Great. And so, what do you look for? Like, I know that on on one side, right, mm -hmm. on the investment side, there's a lot of money. Yeah. And then on the other side, there are a lot of entrepreneurs looking for money. It's like singles not meeting, you know, like a lot of single men, a lot of single women, but, you know, but it's, again, it's like, because of maybe they're not hanging out in the same spaces, or it's not, it's a language issue, or when you meet the values on another line, or it's just scary that if somebody says invest, equity means they're going to take over my mm. company. So what is, what, what, first of all, what do you look for? And then what are the things that you would say people should be comfortable with? Or, okay. So I think from 
an entrepreneur side, five things are super important um, with investors and we're looking for investors. So you might want to take out your pens and papers at this point. <laughs> Because this is the hack uh -huh. time. <laughs> so number one is a clear problem that you're tackling. You have to be able to just articulate that pretty clearly. What is the problem that you're tackling? Number two, what is the solution to that problem? Number three, how are you making money? doing that, solving that problem with your solution. How are you making money? Number four, what traction have you had? So up to this point, what have you actually done? And number five, how big do you see this thing becoming? Mm. Yeah. Okay. okay. I'll give a prize to the person who will remember those five points. <laughs> So number one, be clear about the problem. Be clear about so the problem. if I'm building an app which is blockchain based and it's going to help company get into the fourth industrial revolution. I don't know that's your problem. <laughs> 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 I, yeah. We find a lot of um, businesses really feeling um, they can hack it with just using a lot of buzzwords. And really, your, your problem should be understandable by anybody. It, even if it's a tech platform, even if it's a tech solution, you have to be able to describe your problem to any business person and they should be able to understand it. And so throwing around big words doesn't hack it. How clear can you be? How quickly? So that people are not coming back to you and saying, what? Over the last, say, actually two months, mm. Look, we've got, we launched on the 11th of October. We have 575 applications so far. So, yeah. It's a lot of applications that we're looking for. So we need to be able to just really get what your business does very quickly without us needing to really like scratch our heads and say, what is he trying to say, yeah. I know those 500 plus. Mm. About what percentage is like, wow. <laughs> Three. Um, yeah. What's the, what's the biggest issue with a lot of them? I think, oh It's painful. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Spit it out. <laughs> you can, yeah. I think one of the biggest issues is actually not understanding how you're making money. In, in our context and in Africa, we, are, we don't have a shortage of problems. Yeah. We don't have a shortage of problems. So for the most part, a lot of entrepreneurs are able to identify a problem. Um, sometimes the solutions could be great or not so great, but it's this point of what's your business model? How are you actually going to make money doing this? Mm. And it's, it's important for entrepreneurs to really be clear about what problem they're solving. Is it a personal problem? for a consumer? Is it a business problem for a corporate that you're solving? Or is it a society problem? And a lot of times, because we are in the environment where we have so many society problems, um, we get mixed up as to whether is this, am I solving it for a business or am I solving it for society? And we get lost in how are we actually going to make money with it. And so this, this becomes a problem in articulation of your business model. Like how are you making money? A lot of entrepreneurs fail to actually explain this piece. Yeah. Let's see. Okay. And um, one of the things that then you look for is the team. Right? Yeah. Tell us about the why a lot of investors just won't invest if you're just one person. Oh, there's risk in investing in just one person, right? Because, um, look, he, you give a funny example of like every time you get on a, a taxi or a bus, would all be worrying about, oh, there goes my investment, you know. <laughs> if anything happens to you, then that's it, the business yes. is gone. There is my investment at Caprice. Ooh, my investment <laughs> really, really got drunk. Hey, should my investment be drinking like this? <laughs> my investment is on a plane. <laughs> 
leader for a business, or as a CEO or as a founder, I think three really important things that are necessary for you to focus on. Number one is people. And this doesn't mean you hire up front. It's really knowing who to go to for what and having a support system around you that can provide you with expert services. Key things like just having an accountant who can actually keep this, the numbers for you. Um, having somebody that helps you look over contracts. So you don't have to necessarily hire. Environments like this are amazing for stuff like that, right? Because you actually can find the expertise that you need within communities. So who are the people that you're surrounding yourself with? It's super important for entrepreneurs right from the get-go to be thinking that way um, and to be prioritizing surrounding themselves with good people who can provide them a service. Number two is your strategy. You are, as the leader, you're the one that is seeing the problem. You're the one that's having a vision of how you feel we should get there. It's important that you are quite clear about that. How you get there changes because the environment shifts and stuff like that, and you need to be agile in approach to your strategy. But the vision and where you're going, that's for you to keep front and center. It also actually helps you to attract the right people if you've got an inspiring vision and an inspiring strategy, right? Um, for the most part, when you're starting, you might have limited resources, but if you can sell a really good story to other entrepreneurs to support you, people want to support you. Yeah, we, we've had products where we launch a product and people just kind of come on board and say, what can I do? Because then it's, it's inspiring enough and it, it's, it's an important thing. And the third thing that a leader, found, founder, CEO of an organization has to be thinking about is the cash. And we get very vain about, oh, I made so much sales. It's one thing. Revenue is this much. It's one thing. But the cash that you have in your business and remaining on top of that. Cash is king. If you run out of cash, your business is dead. And so knowing your cash flow patterns when your money is coming in, when it's going out, and planning that will become super important, even when you've got an accountant. Yeah. And how can one get to talk to an investor? Hmm. Like to get in front of investors, because again, investors for the most part won't say, hey, I'm an investor, and because they get bombarded with lots of stuff. But to be taken seriously or somebody who looks at that, what are some of the hacks for that? Cool. Number one hack is research. With the internet, you don't have an excuse for not finding investors. Who are the investors in your particular space? In, like, in Cape Town alone, there's uh, investors that are going to focus on tech. We've got investors focusing on women. We've got investors focusing, focusing on people of color. Who are the investors that are in your space? Um, my inbox on LinkedIn is inundated with white men from Europe <laughs> pitching. It's just like, please read my criteria. It's on my front page. Sadik only, Southern Africa only. <laughs> women, thank you very much. <laughs> So find the investors that are already looking for what you are doing. It makes your introduction, your pitching a lot easier because they will even understand your language from the get-go, right? Number one hack. Number two, where there's an opportunity to get introduced, please get introduced. Even if it's LinkedIn and you find there's a mutual uh, connection, try and see if they actually know them personally and get introduced. It always feels... Um, it says gone, sorry. Ish. <laughs> cool. It always feels a lot warmer if it comes from within the investor's circle and you don't feel like um, you're getting imposed on. If you can get an introduction, get an introduction. If you don't have an introduction, please make your own introduction very quick because they're looking at a lot of information. Mm. Um, we have a one uh, sentence pitch, and if you can pull up that slide, that would be helpful so people can actually just take a picture. Introduce your company name, please take a picture. This is an event where your phones are allowed. <laughs> Introduce your company name, what are you building, what are you creating, uh, what, pro what service are you providing, what is this key offering that you have to give, what are you enabling, what is the problem? How are you solving it? And your secret source. So your secret source is about, first of all, how you are making money. You can mention that. So I'm doing this by charging fees. Or it's a unique value proposition where I'm making money by subscription. Mm. 
but give us something that's going to make it a little bit more unique from maybe your competitors that you can just put in that one sentence. And that's an example of uh, our mentoring platform, Startup Circles. So Startup Circles is building a platform that enables aspiring entrepreneurs to launch their businesses by giving them access to cutting edge tools and world-class mentorship. Yeah. So that catches their attention quickly so that somebody will want to look a little bit deeper. We, like, e even if you're just looking at, at your Twitter feed or your Facebook timeline, so much information. And you stop only on the things that are like, oh, this looks interesting. So how do you make it interesting in one sentence? And with that, I guess it's also because it, when it's very clear, you only attract the people who really matter. In other words, you can't, you can't just throw a lot of things and hope something catches. Yeah. It's like trying to play all positions in football or rugby, yeah. right? And then you won't catch the ball because First of all, your team won't even know where to pass the ball to. Yeah. <laughs> and then also you just be running around so much because you don't have a clear position in what you're building. Yeah. I've received a pitch of 30 paragraphs before. <laughs> 30 paragraphs in LinkedIn. I literally was just like, okay, let me just try and count how many paragraphs this is. I was scrolling down. I couldn't believe it. It was 30 paragraphs. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And advice for women. What do you find to be the difference between when men are pitching and when women are pitching? I know we'll get to questions now. Okay, what's the difference? Because I think for the most part men will pitch more and yeah. then men will get more funding. Yeah. So how do we change it? One is on the investor side but also on the women's side. What are the things that you would say women particularly should look at, look at or do or think about? Um. I think that it's, it's important to describe your business in your language, whatever, uh, this is not like your, whether you're speaking English or Afrikaans, but in your natural language, um, because you will be a lot more comfortable in describing it. And part of our application process is a question where we ask, how has your business grown over the last year? When we're asking that, whatever comes to you naturally, whether you want to speak in the number of customers that you've grown over the year, or you want to speak in the language of revenue that you've grown over the year, or number of products that have grown. We just want to see growth. So be comfortable with describing your business in the language that is most comfortable for you. And be, be okay with that, because at the end of the day, when we get deeper, we'll, we'll talk about um, m like the more meatier metrics. But you, you know your business, so be comfortable with describing your business and not feeling like um, you have to posture it and come off like a guy when presenting and stuff like that. We want, at the end of the day, people invest in people that they like, yeah. yeah. So we want to know you as quickly as possible so that we, we can develop trust and know that um, the person that we're investing in has a vision and really cares about their business, yeah. Brilliant. And um, a last question before we go to questions from the audience. Men are trash. <laughs> what's it been like working with men and what are your thoughts and what are you, what's your view on that? And then we'll take questions from the audience on everything. I should have practiced this one at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've worked with men, I've always worked with men at my whole career and I understand that I've been really lucky. I've been lucky to work with amazing men that have been supportive, that have respected the value that I bring into an organization. Um, yeah, and I, I, I want to give a special shout out to Brad. He's the co-founder of Zona. Please just stand. Yeah. Because <laughs> I. <laughs> um, because the focus has always been on the value that I bring into an organization, and I understand that the experiences of women in different spaces are different. Mm. Um, and this, this is something that we need to respect, and um, my experience has been fortunate, and I'm grateful for that. And it's, I feel it's my responsibility, I've got two boys, to also then raise men who are respectful of women and who respect boundaries. Um, and I'm privileged to be surrounded with such men so that they actually have a good example of that type of men. Um, 
but to give a special shout out to all the guys that are great and that are doing well and to just like raise awareness around sexual harassment that it's real it's everywhere it's in our work environments it's in our homes and to to, to be aware of that and to speak about it every opportunity we get it's it, it's a lot more i guess in your face here in south africa but i do know that in the context of a lot of african countries it's just hidden as well and that it's there and it happens in our homes with relatives and that it's hidden and to be conscious about it and yeah, to really respect everybody's uh, experiences. Yeah. Good. Good. Hi, Lily. Hi, Lily. Hi. Um, MK, my name is Morris. Um, my question is, why women? Oh. That's why you think of all women, because <laughs> even us would want to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Because there's a massive, massive gap in access to finance for women, globally. Globally, there's a 320 billion gap in access to finance for women. In our region, is to, in actually sub-Saharan -Sub Africa, it's 23 billion. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the only region in the world that has more female entrepreneurs than men entrepreneurs. So first of all, let's give ourselves a round of applause. For In spite of that, women are lagging in access to everything, from education to, and this is business education, science education, math education, technology education, to access to technology. There's a lot of African countries where a woman shares a SIM card with her husband and needs uh, to allocate an hour in the day to just access that cell phone. So access to technology is limited. Access to finance is dismal. Ownership is behind. We've got pay gaps still. Women are disadvantaged from the time they're stepping out to become an entrepreneur because they already are getting less pay. So even if we've got some disposable income between me and a peer at the same level, my disposable income will be less, so I'll have less startup capital. So from less startup capital to less access to loans to less access to angel, VC, PE, until the end. And so something needs to be done to level the playing field. And I'm sorry, MK. <laughs> I think there's a lot of us that will um, look at your business. For now, we're trying to remedy the situation on the access to finance for women. Hi, Lulu. My name is uh, Matt Schiff, and it's been great to listen to you tonight, so thank you for that. Um, my question is perhaps a bit more of a softer, hypothetical one. Um, I'd love to know what to focus on first. When you have Simon Sinek start with why mm -hmm. um, around your business model versus reading Daniel Pink's like learn to sell, um, where does one go in inspiring to ask friends to join your venture or actually mm -hmm. just talking to that venture capitalist or someone you want to have a conversation with? Cool. I think your why is quite an important one um, because entrepreneurship is hard, hey? It's hard. <laughs> yeah. Literally, we work 14 hours a day, um, and that's just the honest truth. There's a whole do what you love, and then you'll never work another day in your life. <laughs> do what you love, and then you work 14 hours a day. <laughs> because first of all, you do love it, so you don't you keep working at it, but then it's also a lot of hard work to actually set up a business. And I think it's something that is underestimated. There's real problems when you are running a business. You've got real responsibilities around thinking about your team and their salaries and things like that. So a good why is great because at least when you're going through those hard times, you can look back on it and say, why did I start this thing in the first place? And why should I keep going, right? So a good why matters at a personal level as an entrepreneur. But where do you start? Once you've got your personal why as to why, why I'm doing this thing, is solve, start solving. Start solving and start getting some traction. It's, it's you know, uh, we've been asked, a question that we've been asked is why are you only working with businesses that have started doing something and not ideas? Because there's so many ideas, because we don't have a shortage of problems, so there'll be a lot of ideas. We want to back the people who are doing something about it. So you need to be doing it. You need to have traction. You need to get started. Because 
when you act first, so first you act. From acting you get traction, which is progress. When you're getting progress and traction, then you get attraction. Then actually investors will start to hear about you as well. And so it's not going to even be a cold contact. It's going to be, oh yeah, I've heard about the work that you're doing. Because that traction is everything. We want to see that you've put in some time, you've put in some own skin in the game, and you're committed to this thing. Because why would you expect somebody else to commit to it if you haven't committed to it? So get going first before you even speak to investors. Um, good evening. I am Ispagazi. I work for a startup incubation company that focuses on social impact in entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so the issue that we often face, obviously, as every other entrepreneur, is funding. However, it's often very difficult pitching for funding or even call for applications when your focus is social impact. Because it's no longer just making your profit. Mm -hmm. It's also about making a difference and an impact in your environment or in your community, rather. And so how do you go about looking for funding as an entrepreneur that has not only a profitability aspect, but also a social impact aspect? Great, it's a great question. So there's a lot of impact investors in this space, luckily. And there's incubators like at the Graduate School of Business, the Bertha Center, they've got access to a lot of impact investors who are looking at both. In, in our African context, in all honesty, any investor that's investing in businesses in Africa is also looking at social impact that the business has. Um, but so in, important for you in that space to understand your own business model. How is your business making money? And then if, if you understand who is paying for your product, then you can go to the right people. For example, there's a lot of social businesses that have corporate sponsors paying for that then just go and look for more corporate sponsors to pay for it, right? You might not even need an investor. Um, others might be solving a problem that connects into another business. And uh, for example, you are providing co coding students who you can connect into other businesses. So think about who, whose problem are you solving first and then look for the investors or the organizations that are supporting that space. Thank you very much. Hi, um, my name is Tamir. So, yeah. um, my question is kind of twofold. Okay. One, in regards to the nature of engagement of the women entrepreneurs you've dealt with across the SADC region. So, which areas within the SADC region has the highest concentration of women entrepreneurs? And is, is there a difference, and why do you think that difference exists? Mm -hmm. um, and the second question, the nature of the problem that women entrepreneurs are trying to solve, are there similarities that exist that, that kind of span um, distance? And so a woman entrepreneur in Botswana is solving a very similar problem to a woman entrepreneur in KZN. Yeah. Cool. Great question. Um, yes, higher concentration from the English-speaking countries. Maybe because our website and application process is in English, so definitely higher concentration from the English-speaking countries. Botswana, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa have come out tops, and Tanzania, so these are our top six from the region very similar problems being solved and uh, our, our approach is, is uh, industry agnostic so we're looking at both industries and we're finding there are certain industries that are jumping out a lot more um, yeah so this we can still see some trends around tech we're seeing trends around beauty um, trends around agriculture and manufacturing and healthy foods yeah those are trends that we're seeing yeah. cool. all right um, hi Elena. I really thank you for this talk. You are amazing. Um, I've got two questions. One is around you being um, an angel investor. Does one need to have big funds to get into um, investing in other people's companies as an angel? And also, what prepares one to be an angel? And just around that as well, um, I just want to know if, as an entrepreneur, do I have to tell my investor everything? I know you mentioned something around, <laughs> something around um, your secret sauce. Mm -hmm. How do you tell? Like, how do you tell what information is sufficient enough for an investor to buy into what you are uh, pitching? And then the other one, the other question is around your journey, which is very fascinating. And I really think um, you've done amazing stuff. And for you to work with big companies, I mean, small companies, and actually growing them into being big companies is super amazing. So 
how do you navigate from working with or for great companies and also leaving and hopping onto something else without burning bridges? Because I really oh. love the relationship that you currently have with Zona as much as you've hopped onto something else right now. And I really think it's a beautiful thing. But how do you then move onto the next things without and, and still keep that beautiful relationship <laughs> that is still going? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, First question around how much money do you need to become an angel investor? Um, so the good thing about angel investors is they will invest early on so you don't need a lot of money. Um, you can join with other angel investors to gain experience actually as to what they're looking for and what they're doing and how they're supporting companies. Ideally an angel investor should have experience of their own, entrepreneurial experience of their own because they don't just bring to the table money, they're bringing experience and support and connections and all, stuff, all sorts of stuff. 80% of what I was doing whilst I was angel investing was actually just creating introductions and opening doors. Like there's this opportunity here and that opportunity there. You know, and so you, it would be great if you've got some entrepreneurial experience to pass on to the entrepreneur as an angel. But there's groups that you can join where you invest with others, and so that helps with not needing too much money. So that's useful. One, not burning bridges. That's a great question. Um, I, I actually never understood the the concept of burning bridges because the world is so small, right? It's tiny. Like the world is tiny. Really, we used to say six degrees of separation, like you need to be introduced by six people, you can meet anybody. It's now two, really. <laughs> if I really wanted to get uh, President Cyril's phone number, I could get it by two people, you know, two introductions, seriously. And so for me, burning bridges is so unnecessary, and the, the, it, you manage that by being real. In your conversations, in how you're seeing things, in how you're feeling. Having honest conversations, as difficult and courageous as sometimes they have to be, just makes the work less, you know, in the long run. If you are real with what you're going through and what you're thinking and what you're planning and taking everybody along on a journey with you, saying goodbye becomes a lot easier. Um, and part of why I've been able to move is that I've never attached my, my worth or value identity to anything. The, and the first experience I had of this was when I decided I didn't want to be a CA anymore. I, t I had two weeks of just crying, like, what am I going to be then? <laughs> and then I decided in that moment, I'm just actually Ledemba. That's it. I, I don't need to be called Ledemba the CA. <laughs> I, I just, I am valuable because I've got value to bring to any place. And so being comfortable that um, wherever you will go, you can add value and learn makes it easier for you to be on the journey, but take people on the journey with you so you're not surprising people. I love good surprises, I don't like bad surprises. So <laughs> imagine just your key employee just walking and saying, hey, I'm out. That's horrendous. So take people on a journey with you and it makes those separations a lot easier. Great. Yeah. Thanks, we'll take the last questions. Last three, right? Last, <laughs> last four. Okay, um, the last four hands. And then we'll go to networking and we can continue the conversation. So we are over time, but we'll keep the answers short. Yes, mm -hmm. Anim. Yo, um, first of all, a couple of goals. <laughs> um, my other question is more around the VC aspect of you know, your life now at Enigma Ventures, all that kind of stuff. Um, a trend we're seeing in like the early space in Africa and investing and that kind of stuff is a lot of international partners coming into Africa, so limited partners like Enigma coming to Africa Trust Group, etc. But there's a whole concept of like blitz scaling and a lot of these companies, but we don't really have the infrastructure in Africa for that. And so then you end up getting companies like Jumia or Trace, you know, no disrespect to those guys, but you know, they've gone, some of them have gone to Y Combinator, they've come out, they've flopped, engineers are now working day jobs. But then on the other hand, with local companies like Zona and Yoko, you know, doing amazing jobs. And I think the concept there is that the CEOs are still local, do you know what I mean? Mm. And so they know the aspects of the game and that's why they're growing well. But it turns out that it's a slower pace, right? As opposed to, again, the American companies that are blitz scale. With Enigma, what's your leeway? And what controls do you have in place to be like, yo, first of all, this is Africa, you need flexible capital. 
Um, and what are you doing to ensure that you know you're not just gonna fund women and then have Enigma be like, yo, bruh, these companies are dying off, what's going on? Like, they're supposed to exit in three to five years. You know, like it takes time. Yeah. It's a different yeah, story this side, yeah. you know? Cool. It's it's patient capital, first of all, and it's put together by entrepreneurs that have grown and scaled businesses in Africa in Europe and in the US and so we do understand the differences in dynamics across the continents and like we said we are reimagining we are reimagining finance altogether and looking at how do we make this win-win both from the investor side and from the entrepreneur side and so it's, it will be a journey and you can ask me that after three years Um, hi, Lelemba. Mine is a simple one. I just wanted to get examples of um, startups that you guys have invested in with the Enigma and the 100 million fund. And um, I think you mentioned one or two are in the audience. So just to get a, a sort of like a, a visual picture of where you guys have taken them and the type of funding you've provided. So is it loans, the equity, combinations, etc. So we launched the Enigma Fund on 11th of October. So we've got an open call right now and we haven't invested in any businesses yet with the fund. So we've got an open call right now. What we're looking for is evidence of growth and that you are seeing your business becoming big. We have opened it up to all industries to make sure that everybody gets a chance to get, yeah, not just tech, so all industries so that everybody gets a chance who has the potential for growth. Um, but like I said, those five things become important. The problem, how you're solving it, how are you making money, what, if, what progress have you had, and how big do you see this thing becoming? If you are clear on those things, you've got a higher likelihood of getting into the program. The type of things that you, so funding you're looking at oh. equity or no? Oh, no, equity, equity. Um, we are looking at partnerships, however, with uh, banks who are coming on board and very interested in co-investing, and they're happy to put up on the loan side. Cool. Second, last question. Hi, Lelemba. My name is Kaluba, also from Zambia. Thank you so much for your story, especially your background story. I could relate to so much. I just wanted to ask, um, with entrepreneurship, that's, that's an idea. Mm. And the idea comes from a thought. And I'm a strong believer in you know, cultivating your mindset. Mindset is a big part of, I think, entrepreneurship. Mm. And so um, cultivating your mindset also involves you know, reading books. And I just wanted to ask you, for aspiring entrepreneurs, um, what books could you recommend, or what other resources or tools could you recommend? Gosh. <laughs> okay. Gosh, there's so many. Um, I would say Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki is very important because then you understand whether you are self-employed or a business, and it's it's all okay. Whichever side you choose to be in, it's okay as long as you understand which side that you're in. Um, for your whole mindset, I loved Think and Grow Rich. It's one of the books for me that really made me think about things differently. Um, Lean In for Women, super important around navigating your career and where you grow a business. And my most recent favorite is Principles by Ray Dalio. Yeah. Hmm. And Lean Startup. Oh, I Lean Startup. Yeah, it's his. <laughs> <laughs> Keeping the peace in the world. <laughs> Cool. Um, okay, last question now, and then... <laughs> uh, hi, my name is Nomza Mokuzayo. Hi. I'm so inspired and I'm so uh, proud of you. Thank you. And with everything that you're doing. And my question is, um, I'm in the construction industry, of which is one of those that are challenging for women. And... Um, Look, I'm working a lot with contractors, which are entrepreneurs, and I do a lot of free uh, service in terms of the challenges that they face, because I'm working for a government, a national department, as a construction project manager. So um, I'm inspired to stay there for about 20 years now, only because I feel most uh, contractors who are black and women are lacking a lot of um, finance and apart from that uh, they're lacking a lot of um, confidence because there's few of, of, of companies like yours or, or 
I was also inspired with the law part of what was uh, one of the videos there where I mm. feel that maybe I will also um, refer them because most cases they would uh, experience contractual um, issues. Okay. Mm. So um, how would you advise in, in, in that uh, aspect for, for contractors like that? Um, I think uh, it depends on what they're needing in terms of support, but I, I hear what you're saying. I think it's really important you remaining in the industry because we do need role models everywhere and it makes it easier for people to aspire to get into spaces when they can see people who look like them in the space. And so first of all, applause to you for remaining in the industry in spite of there being few women and few people of color. But there, there, there is a lot of support, and I think Cape Town is not short of support. It's environments like this, like now you've seen the Skuman Law, so you're able to refer them to support like that. Um, depending on what they need, please feel free to reach out into this community as well, to the Sarah Bryan community. I'm sure they can refer you to a number of key support services, whether it's finance or it's a confidence-building type of workshop. So, yeah. Thank you. And for people that want to apply, oh, yeah. where should they go? Really great one, thank you. <laughs> so please go to www.enigmaventures, enigma spelled E-N-Y-G-M-A, ventures.com. And there's apply buttons all over the website, so you won't miss it. It's a quick application, it's 21 questions. If you know your business, you really can apply in one sitting. You don't even have to go back and forth. And same things I've been talking about will be repeated there. So yeah, if you're clear about your problem and stuff, well, that you'll be able to just answer the application. And feel, please, just do it. Be confident. The, the, the European guys are doing it, so. <laughs> <laughs> we need the real people that we're solving for to do it. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Lenemba.